Welcome everyone. This is my presentation on hyper succinct trees. This is a paper for ASA 2021. I'm Sebastian Wild from the University of Liverpool, and this is joint work with Ian Munro, Pat Nicholson, and Luisa Silbach Benkner. Here's my outline for today. I will briefly discuss where this work comes from and then show what our hyper succinct trees are. We'll talk about tree sources and distributions over tree shapes. And in the long version of this talk, I will give two examples where we exemplify our analysis in detail. And finally, we'll apply it to get new data structure results for the RMQ problem. This work really has three fields that it brings together. One is data structures, in particular succinct data structures, where we try to store an object in the worst case number of bits of space where we allow ourselves a lower order term of extra space to support operations efficiently. The second pillar is information theory, where the key object of study is universal source codes, compression methods that are optimal asymptotically for a family of sources that generate random objects. And lastly, the analysis of algorithms, which contributes techniques, mathematical tools to analyze uh, combinatorial objects and uh, random distributions of parameters on these objects. We bring this together by presenting hyper succinct trees. This is a, a single simple code for binary trees, a compression method for binary trees, that on the one side can be augmented to support all sorts of operations on trees efficiently in constant time on a word RAM while at the same time achieves the best space bound that we know for any universal uh, source code on, on uh, a whole list of, of binary tree sources. And uh, we built in our analysis on the tools from the A of A community. In the second part, I want to give some background and uh, introduce what our hyper succinct trees really are. There are data structures known to store a tree succinctly. That means with 2n plus little o of n bits of space. And this works either for an ordinal tree or for a binary tree. And uh, we can um, support a long list of operations on these trees. We can navigate locally, go to the parent or child links. We can also find depths or ancestors or even the, the ancestor at a certain depth. We can also find how big the subtree is, how high the sub the subtree rooted at a certain node is, lowest common ancestors, and furthermore specialized operations. All of these have been worked out for several competing approaches, how to represent the tree. So succinct binary trees usually work by representing the tree in a certain way and then adding indices on top of that that only take a, a little low of an extra space. Um, and then support these operations. Tree covering is one of these approaches to, uh, to store a tree succinctly. Here, the core idea is to decompose a tree first into mini trees, and then the mini trees again into micro trees. So the overall tree is repre represented like in this picture. It's a, it's a tree of roughly n over log squared nodes, but each of the nodes is a mini tree, which itself consists of roughly log n nodes, and each of that nodes uh, is again a micro tree consisting of, of at most log n divided by four nodes. Within little o of n extra space, you can afford to store log n bits for each of the mini trees and log log n bits for each of the micro trees. And uh, that's enough to support all these operations from the table on the last slide. Because the micro trees are so small, there's only log n over four of those nodes in each micro tree. There's only root n different shapes that you can possibly have in a micro tree. And that means you can just list them all and even spell out all the results for all thinkable operations inside a micro tree in a giant, in a global lookup table. Uh, that's known as the four Russians technique in, in the data structures area. And that's what makes tree covering work on the microtree side and the other parts piece it together 
uh, between microtrees and the other parts. The interesting observation here is that the dominant space from storing all these different pieces comes from remembering the shapes of all the microtrees. How does each little microtree look like? I have to usually just uh, write that down somehow. And that gives the two end bits. Everything else is a lower order term. If we're only interested in a code in compressing trees, then we can take the fairly complicated constructions in a tree covering data structure and uh, simplify it to this simple code. We store two things about the tree. We store how the micro trees connect. That only needs little o of n bits of space. Here's spelled out how to do that in detail, but this is not relevant for the talk. And we store the shapes of all the micro trees using a Huffman code. That's all there is to it. And uh, that gives us a code that stores a tree using, well, whatever it takes to spell out the shapes of all the micro trees plus little o of n. And this code can be augmented into a data structure using exactly the same techniques as in tree covering. And all the contribution of our paper is to precisely analyze this code for many different distributions of tree shapes. And uh, that, gives us, that gives us our main result. I want to very briefly show how to best decompose a binary tree. And uh, here's the algorithm from Parsons Monroe 2014. I don't want to go into much detail. It's a bottom-up method, relatively straightforward. It all fits on this slide. The only thing I want you to remember is we call a node heavy whenever it has at least B descendants. Here's an example for how this tree covering works. It's a binary tree. Uh, and if we apply the procedure from the previous slide with the parameter B set to six, then this, these are the micro trees that you get for it. Now note that uh, every component here might have an entire subtree on the left omitted and an entire sub subtree on the right side of the root omitted, but otherwise it's a complete connected component of the tree. And that means if we contract all the components into a single vertex, we again get a binary tree. We can use that and other insights from the algorithm to prove uh, these properties of the tree decomposition. We have not too many micro trees. None of them is very big. They actually partition the nodes of the tree. Unlike in the general case for ordinal trees, for binary trees, we get a partition. Every node is in only one of the components, in exactly one of the components. Uh, each component has three edges to the outside, a parent left and right edge, or fewer. And um, yeah, if the root, if you have a root of a micro tree, it's always a heavy node. The data structure side of this paper is not very heavy. We take tree covering and replace the way to store the micro trees by a Huffman code. What makes the paper interesting is that this is enough to get optimal compression for a huge variety of tree distributions. And that's one of what we'll look at in this part. In information theory, we study families of sources, random sources for certain objects. The classical version of that is we have a memoryless source for text or maybe a Markov source for text that emits one symbol at a time. And then we try to find a universal source code for this family of sources. And again, the classical example um, from information theory is on text. And that is that the lempel sif algorithms are universal codes for Markov sources of text. What does it mean to be a universal code? It means it matches the entropy of the source up to lower order terms to store a random object. Um, and the universal means that the code does not need to know what the random source looks like. For example, in the Markov case, what are the transition probabilities and the emission probabilities for certain letters? This is not known to a lempel sif algorithm to compute um, a compressed form of a text. And this universality means that the compression technique is widely applicable. These are often simple algorithms, the compression methods, but their analysis isn't necessarily simple. And we'll see that again for binary trees.
if you want to apply the same piece of theory to binary trees instead of text, we need a notion of source for binary trees. And this is essentially giving us a probability distribution over tree shapes. We study a list of different such um, probability distributions, uh, and they all essentially generate a tree um, step by step. We start with one node, and then in the first example, the memoryless type process, there's a particular probability for that node to have two children, or only a left, or only a right, or be a leaf. And we just um, start at one at one node, draw its type, and then we recurse on its left and right subtrees if they exist. A kth order type process is the same, except that now the types are not given with fixed probabilities, but instead this probability depends on the types of the k ancestors of the node that we are currently generating the type for. These two are essentially equivalent to the the Markov process for, for text. A little more interesting, a little more specific for trees are the fixed size sources. Here we need a target size for the tree. We specify up front we want exactly n nodes. And then we draw how many of these n nodes that are uh, in the subtree of a certain node we're currently looking at are in the left sub uh, left subtree of that node and how many of them are in the right subtree of that node. So there's, um, for every node, a contribution to the overall probability of p of the left and right sizes of that node. We can do the same using the height of subtrees instead of the size. Then the height is fixed up front, but the number of nodes is still random. And the last uh, somewhat different class of trees is just if you specify some subclass of trees, uh, I want a uniform tree from that subclass, uniformly and random chosen from that subclass. It's worth pointing out that unlike in the text case, these notions of sources are too general to allow any universal source code. Intuitively, these fixed size sources, for example, they allow a different distribution of splits for every n. Um, and that means they contain too much information to allow a universal source code. You can create uh, examples of sources that are so specific that uh, no code is, is powerful enough to adapt to all of these simultaneously. So we will have to restrict uh, fixed size sources and fixed height, height sources um, in a certain way to make, make universal source codes possible. And here are the restrictions for which we could make our codes to work. These are various uh, different types of distributions, fixed height, fixed size, etc., and uh, restrictions for which uh, we can show universality of the hypersuxing code that I've shown you before. I just want to point out that while these restrictions may look a little arbitrary, they coincide exactly with the restrictions that in previous work were needed to show that other more specific codes are universal for these classes. But prior to our work, there was not uh, a single code that works for all of these known. Um, at least it wasn't proven. Whereas the hypersuxing code works for all of these sources without adapting at all to any of them. It just works as is. And uh, from the computer science perspective, here is uh, a list of, of concrete distributions um, over binary trees, which can be expressed in the language of these sources. So for example, random binary search trees, uh, where we start with a random permutation and insert elements in random order, um, can be represented as a monotonic fixed size source, and uh, we can optimally compress them. And similarly, for uniformly random weight balanced binary search trees, they can be expressed as a, a fringe dominated fixed size binary tree source. And again, we get an optimal compression. Here, the entropy is not known, but whatever it is, we will meet it in, in expectation.
In the next part, I want to illustrate our analysis of hypersuccinct trees and hypersuccinct code on two specific families of trees, random binary search trees and uniform weight bounds trees. Random binary search trees start with a random permutation of the numbers 1 up to n, and then successively insert these numbers into an em initially empty unbalanced binary search tree. It's an interesting distribution because it heavily favors balanced trees over, over high trees. And so uh, there's substantial compression to be achieved. The second example, uniform weight balanced trees are defined as follows. A node is alpha balanced if its left subtree and its right subtree size are at least an alpha fraction of, of its entire subtree size. And uh, here, the challenge is that, uh, first of all, it's a fairly small class. Most trees are not weight balanced. But also, uh, if you take a microtree somewhere in the middle and uh, take away the, the child microtrees, the resulting microtree as a tree is not necessarily alpha balanced. So we have to work around this, around this issue. The two examples are chosen so that they illustrate the key uh, steps needed to analyze all the, all the other sources. And they also show the key obstacles uh, that we had to overcome. Random binary search trees are characterized by the fact that the first insertion is the first element of a random permutation, so every possible split is equally likely. And that means the probability for the entire tree can be written as a product over all the nodes, where we take one over the size of the subtree rooted at that node. This can be written as a fixed size source, where for each node we choose uniformly at random how many, mm, how many of its descendants go in the left and how many go in the right subtree. So only uh, the total number of nodes here is important, L plus N minus 1 minus L. Uh, but it, the probability doesn't depend on L. We'll proceed in, in four steps with this analysis. First, we'll construct a source-specific code for microtrees, one that knows what source we're using and makes use of that fact. We use that to show that a given microtree is encoded with essentially the correct number of bits namely log of one over the probability, one can show that this is exactly what you have to achieve. The second step is to use that we can use a Huffman code instead of the specific uh, source specific code and that only makes things better. Then we have to go from individual micro trees to the entire tree. And finally, we can put all these inequalities together. How can we construct a source specific code that optimally compresses a random binary search tree knowing that this is the distribution at hand? Here's how. We'll first store the size of the current microtree in some self-delimiting code like Eli Eli Elias Gamma code. And then we will use arithmetic coding to store all the left subtree sizes. We'll proceed in a depth first traversal of the tree and I'll illustrate this on this example tree on the, on the right. So we start at v1. As in always in arithmetic coding, we will represent the sequence of outcomes as a subinterval of the unit interval 0, 1. We always know recursively initially from, from part 1 how big the subtree is that we still have to store. For v1, that means we have five possibilities for a split, how many nodes go into the left subtree, could be anything between zero and four. In this case, we know it's, it's three. Each of these possible outcomes is as associated with a subinterval of the current interval of length one fifth. And because here we have the outcome three, there's three nodes in the left subtree, we choose the fourth um, of these intervals, that happens to be the interval that spreads from 3 over 5 to 4 over 5. 
Now for the next node, restoring the left subtree size of v2, we proceed in the same way. We recursively know that its subtree size is 3. That's what we just stored. So there's these three possibilities of how many nodes can go into the left subtree. And we use subintervals of the current interval to encode each of these. In this case, it's the middle outcome is one node in the left subtree. So we choose the appropriate interval and go there. The next node in the depth first traversal is V3, which has a, a single descendant, namely itself. So we know there's nothing to store. There's no possible split that we have to make. And the nice thing about this encoding is that we store not, nothing for this node. And we also store nothing for the other two nodes because they also have subtree size one. So we are left with the final interval that we had after V2, two thirds up to 1115. The rest is standard arithmetic coding. We find a certain dyadic subinterval of the interval and encode the interval by the, the numerator here in, in binary. And uh, just by, um, by, see, by analyzing how often you have to cut things in half, you can show that this number of bits that we store is at most log over one log of one over the length of the interval plus two extra bits. And that is what we call the depth first arithmetic code for a tree for a given source s, where for each node we store in essentially the optimal space what is the possible outcome. Here we always have to split in left and right, but we can apply this um, to the other sources as well. And if you go through the example again, you'll see that we shrink our interval always exactly by a factor p of the subtree sizes. And that's exactly the probability that this node correspond, co contributes to the probability of the entire tree. So the length of the final subinterval is exactly the probability of the entire mitra tree. And the length of the code is hence log of one over that probability plus this additive two error from arithmetic coding. Because we are in hypersuccinct code actually using a Huffman code for storing the micro tree shapes instead of this DS, we can't directly use this fact, but because Huffman codes are optimal prefix free codes, we get the inequality that the size of all the codes for the micro trees in the Huffman code is no bit no worse than the source specific code and we have our upper bound for that code. Step three is going from micro tree codes to the entire tree. And here there's a little caveat that you can see on this example. When we store the yellow tree as a micro tree, we omit the red part. This is not stored as part of this micro tree, with all, which means that we use incorrect subtree sizes for storing, for example, this node 60. The key observation here is that while in general this is a problem, in general uh, this will not be an optimal encoding then, in this case it works because our numbers that we use, the left and right subtree sizes, they only get smaller. We only throw away entire subtrees and the probabilities or the splits in our distribution of random binary search trees, they have this monotonicity property listed here. Essentially, a split becomes only less likely if I add nodes on either side. Given that, we can piece things together as follows. The product over all the probabilities for the micro trees, we can rewrite that as summing over all, as, as, as taking the product over all the individual nodes. And then here we have the subtree sizes, but with respect to the micro tree, because of the monotonicity, we can transfer that to the entire tree. And then again, just this double product is a product over all the nodes in the tree exactly once. And that's by definition, the probability of the tree. So by putting these two things together, we get our first result, namely, here are the, first, the two steps just repeated. The size of the encoding in our hypersuccinct code is what we need for the Huffman code plus a little order n. That's coming from storing how the micro trees fit together. This is a Huffman code, and using step two, we can upper bound its length 
by log of one over the probability for each of the micro trees. And then rearranging that um, and using step three, this is at most log of one over the probability for the entire tree. For random binary search trees, we actually can rewrite this probability further. It's just the sum of the log of all the subtree sizes. And you may recognize this as the splay tree potential, which is an interesting connection of these areas. If you have a random tree, the expected number of this of this space that we need is, is given by this 1.736n, which is substantially less than 2n. And it's interesting that this is a, a constant that we can only write as this, this series exactly. That finishes the proof for random binary search trees. But let's look at the second example to see a few other challenges. Uniform weight balanced binary search trees are denoted by WN. And uh, they're not so well understood. In particular, there's not even known how many of these of size n exist. Uh, but some simple properties can be listed. They always have logarithmic height. If I take a fringe subtree, so a node and all its descendants, that's again a weight balanced uh, tree. There's not too many nodes that have many descendants. Only n over b nodes have at most have at least b descendants. And indeed, we can uh, generate this family, the uniform distribution over this family using a fixed size source with that probability. Basically, a split in L and n minus 1 minus L is as likely as as many combinations we have for the left subtree, for the right subtree, and uh, divide that by the total number of trees of that size. That's a general recipe for getting uniform distributions using this uh, notion of fixed size sources. But the problem is here that this, this distribution is not monotonic. So the trick from the random binary search tree case doesn't, doesn't work here. But keep this property in mind that there's only n over b nodes of, of, of uh, subtree size at least b. So one complication here is that non-fringe subtrees are in general not alpha balanced. Why is that a problem? Well, it means that this step three from above is impossible here to show. It's not, it's not true in general that the product of the, sub, the micro tree probabilities is a bound for the probability of the entire tree because some of these can be just zero. These are probabilities in the family, in the distribution, and if some of the micro trees are not even weight bounds, they get prob uh, probability zero. Now we can try to use that trees are nicely balanced. So maybe we can just ignore all those non fringe subtrees. If a tree is, is nicely balanced, then most of the nodes should be at the fringe, right? Unfortunately, this is not quite good enough because we can construct weight balanced trees where there's a constant fraction of the nodes in non-fringe micro trees. Now we can still make use of this fact that weight balanced trees are fringe dominated. This is the name we used for this property that only n over b nodes have a subtree of size at least b. To make use of that, we have to break our code up into several parts. If we have a micro tree like the yellow one here, which is not fringe, then we break it into a bow, which consists of all the heavy nodes, those with at least B descendants, and whatever's left, which in this case are these little fringe micro trees that we call twigs. Now, our source specific code now becomes slightly different. It is either using the depth first arithmetic code as before, if the micro tree we're storing is fringe. And if it's not like the yellow here, then we store the bow separately using two bits per node in a balanced parenthesis encoding. And we use the depth first arithmetic coding from before just on the twigs. Now we do store the bows suboptimally, but because it's a fringe dominated distribution, those are a vanishing fraction of T and we can actually ignore them. 
the important part is that the, the twigs can still in total make up a lot of the tree, but we do use the depth first uh, arithmetic code for those, which stores them in optimal space. Hyper succinct trees are a tree data structure that automatically adapt in their space usage to redundancy found in a given tree. In the last part of this talk, I want to apply this to get new data structures results for the classic RMQ problem. In the range maximum query problem, we're given a static array of numbers at pre-processing time. And then at query time, we would like to find where in a given range is the largest element in the array. So in this example, the range, the query would be from six to 14 and the answer would be nine because that's the index where we have the maximum. We don't care about the value. So that turns the problem into a comparison based problem. And in case of ties, we report the leftmost such position. A classic observation is that we can construct from the array, the so-called Cartesian tree, where we find the maximum in the array, make that the root that splits the array into a part that's left of this maximum and right of this maximum. And then the Cartesian trees recursively built for these parts become the left and right child of this root. If we do that, we can translate RMQ queries to a query solely on the tree as follows. We take the outermost elements in our range, 6 and 14, and find the nodes in the tree that have the in-order index of that index, 6 and 14. And then the range maximum query is the lowest common ancestor of those two nodes in the tree. So we can translate from range max query to lowest common ancestor in the trees. And we can use a data structure that just works for binary trees and knows nothing about RMQ to solve that problem. If we apply our hyper succinct trees to that, then we obtain two new results. One is an RMQ data structure with optimal expected space for random permutations, and also an optimal space data structure for RMQ on sequences where we have R sorted runs, uh, segments where um, the values are weakly increasing. With that, I want to conclude. I've shown you hyper succinct trees, which are very simple if you're just after a source code for trees, but they're as versatile as any of the other known universal source codes for binary trees that have been presented before. And at the same time, they can be transformed into a data structure using the tree covering techniques for supporting all sorts of operations in constant time. We'd like to extend this to trees with labels and other combinatorial structures. This is ongoing work. Thanks for your attention and hope to answer questions in the ASA sessions.